Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I'm going to start by telling you a story of what happened to me last weekend. And as I tell the story, I want you to... Um, I'm a firm believer in learning from the things that happen to us in life. So as I tell you the story, I'm going to ask afterwards for you to tell me what is the life lesson I am supposed to learn from my experience. Okay? And I'm going to want contributions. Okay? So I went last weekend to see my sister who lives in France. And I went for a couple of nights to see her because I've not seen her in a long time. And um, I went alone. It, it was... For, I didn't like not going with my family, but I did go alone because I wanted to see her. And so I had to get from York to Gatwick to fly over to Toulouse in France. So I left early in the morning, and the way I was raised was that you leave plenty of time. Who was raised like that? Who was raised that you have to get there four hours before your play? Right, who's last minute? You make me feel on edge, you last-minute people. So because of the way I was raised and what's been drilled into me, I left plenty of time to get to the airport. So I got the train in the morning, travelled down, got into London's King's Cross, had to go from London's King's Cross on the tube to Victoria, and then from Victoria, I was going to catch the Gatwick Express and get me there three and a half hours early for my flight. So, get to Lon London, Victoria, and all the trains had shut down. There were no trains going out of London, Victoria. So my first thought was to feel a touch smug, because I thought, ha-ha, I have, I have a backup plan for this very scenario that is now useful. So I thought, this is OK. I have plenty of time. I'm not panicking. So I went and asked the um, guard person. I, I wasn't even going to attempt to work out where I was going, because um, I, had no, I had no clue. So I asked the guard person, I need to get to Gatwick, what's the alternative route? So she said, you need to get on that train over there, you need to change at Hearn Hill, go to East Croydon, and that'll take you to Gatwick. So I'm like, I wrote it, on, I wrote it down, Hearn Hill, East Croydon, Gatwick. So she said, I said, are you absolutely sure? And she checked with someone else, so that was two people. So I thought, right, I have two, two people telling me this information. I can trust this information. So I get on another train, and I get to Hearn Hill. So when I get to Hearn Hill, um, me being me, I start to think, oh, well, I really better had check again. So I went and checked with a third person, a third guard, thinking if three of them give me this information, I'm fine. Said to the third guard, right, I need to get to Gatwick. So then she said, oh, you need platform one, Blackfriars. And you know when you're thinking, that's not East Croydon, but you're here, I'm at the station. So I get on the train, I go to Blackfriars, which is about 20 minutes away. So I'm thinking, it's fine, still got plenty of time, I'm all right. Get to Blackfriars, there I then ask another guard and another passenger, I want to get to Gatwick. And they said, yeah, you just need to get on this platform. This get on this train to Gatwick. I'm thinking, I'm fine, this is fine. I've been on the train for 20 minutes, Guess where I pass? I went straight past Hearn Hill again. <laughs> so I literally spent 40 minutes going on a round trip that wasn't at all required, back through the station I'd just passed through um, to get to Gatwick. I was still two and a half hours early for my flight. Come on. <laughs> so those of you who leave the last minute, and it was very clear who were the people on the train that had not built in their own little bit of buffer time. I was a, an oasis of calm. Now, <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't. So, OK. So my question was this. What is the life lesson that I should learn from my experience? OK. OK. Anybody else got a contribution of what else was could? <laughs> that, yes, that is the life lesson. Anybody else got something that I can learn from my experience? I want one more. Always leave plenty of time. Yeah, that's been proven. What, there was one over here. Look up to map. What? Trust the map, not a person. I trust people more than objects. <laughs> that's probably not true, is it? Um, 
Yeah, make sure I'm going the right way. That would have been a good one, actually. But the <laughs> close the airport. And what? Do we, go on. I'm going on a bus. I don't like buses. Now, and then, <laughs> don't go. Don't go. There you go. Now. All of you have heard that story, and yet all of you have... Th there was at least seven different things that I could learn from that experience. Now, I'm going to read you a story, and um, what I want you to be thinking all the time as you hear this story is what is the message that I am supposed to hear from this story? What is the key message? Now, there might be more than one, but what is the key message that I'm supposed to hear from this story? Now, some of you who know the story are going to bring your own preconceptions to the story, but I want you to try and almost just read it as it is and not read what you've heard before and what you think it is, okay? So let's have a read. It's only sure, it's coming up. Oh, it's quite small writing, can you see that? The parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, there's a bit in the middle, but then later Jesus explains it to his disciples. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, we are all wired so differently. And I want you just to think for just a few seconds of what you hear hear from that story. I messaged a few people yesterday and said, when you think of this story, what's your first reaction? And it was fascinating because everybody's was different. Everybody heard something different. Now, when I, uh, when I mentioned to Chris yesterday that I was going to speak about this story, um, she immediately said what it meant to her. And I was shocked because it was so different to what it meant to me. Because the thing that she said was, oh, isn't it an amazingly positive story? And I'm thinking, I don't, positive? <laughs> I don't, what do you mean? And um, she said, well, you know, whatever the types of soil are, the seed is always going to find a way to grow. So her interpretation of it was this incredibly positive thing, which I'm going to sort of elaborate on in a little while. Now, that was so different to me because when I hear this story, what it does in my head, and has always done in my head, is it makes, I hear that I have to make this incredible effort to make sure I understand what God is saying to me. I have to make myself good soil. I hear things to do when I hear that story. I hear that I better deal with the shallow areas in my life. I better deal with those, because otherwise I'm going to be in trouble, because I'm not going to the kingdom's going to be somehow snatched from me. Um, I hear that I better make sure I worry less, I handle my money right. I hear that if I don't do these things, somehow I'm in trouble. And I hear from that story that God's kingdom can be very, very easily limited in my life. In fact, there's only sort of a one in four option that I'm going to even get it right. All the others, somehow, I'm, if I'm not good enough, I'm going to somehow 
not produce kingdom the way I'm supposed to produce kingdom. Now, some of you don't hear that because you're not wired like that, but some of you are wired like me. And what you hear when you hear that story is that we have this responsibility for making sure that we are very, very good soil. Now, I'm not saying that there's not an implication that we should consider how we live, but is that the key message? Let's keep going. If I am not really fruitful, this is what I hear, it means that I must be the problem. So if, I'm not, if there's not the right sort of fruit coming out of my life, my life is a problem. And I just hear that I'm responsible for working incredibly hard to make sure that I don't let the kingdom down. Now, when I asked a few people for their impressions of the story, they all gave incredibly lovely and positive thoughts, but every single one of them also referred to the fact that there's an onus on us to do something. Um, now, when I've studied it, I've studied this story and I've read around about it and I've talked to a few people about it and I just want to share where I've got to. And then you can decide what you think, whether you think the key message I've come to is, a, is the one that you think the story is. It's up to you. But I think it will be exciting and I think it will certainly give you something to think about. Now, the problem when I started to write down that I was going to talk about this story, I immediately wrote down, uh, read the parable of the soil. So I started with the soil but it's actually called the parable of the sower. So already I'm coming at it from this angle that it's to do with the types, not to do with the, the source. So that's been my fundamental problem because the story actually begins with the sower and the, se and the seed because the soil's actually quite passive in this story. It's just there. It's being acted upon and it's... It's there in the same way that the soil in your garden is there. Um, the soil receives the seed whatever state it is in. The farmer doesn't say, well, I'm not going to scatter any over there on the rocks because what's the point? Or I'm not going to scatter any on the path because what's the point? He scatters it indiscriminately over every type, which is exciting because if you think that the four grounds represent really all types of terrain... Think about how they represent all types of people. If all types of people get chance to experience something being sown into them, it's not like the sower says, I'm not bothering with that, like, what's the point? What's the point? Well, like, it, they, all get, they all actually get to experience it. And this is not just in this story. There are loads and loads and loads of parables in the Bible that are very much emphasizing the fact that included in this kingdom that has come, because the kingdoms like these things and that it were given pictures, is everything and everyone is included. Everything and everyone is included and that everything and everyone gets to be part of it. Now, the seed of the kingdom is being sown into each of our lives regardless of the state we are in. It really is. It's not like one day, oh, you know, God looks down on us and from wherever. Even that idea, God looks down on us like he's somehow this, I mean, what does that mean? Almost says, oh, I think you're doing a good job today. There you go. I'll put a bit of kingdom in you. But on another day, he thinks, ugh, not interested today. You're not going to do any good with anything I give you. So I'm just not going to bother today. It doesn't work like that. Kingdom comes. Kingdom invests. Kingdom flows. Kingdom is here. We're in it and it's happening all around us. And the seed might work very minimally and mysteriously, but it has incredible power to work. Now, if it lands on the path, think of this. It lands on the path and it refers to it being sown into the heart, but then it gets snatched away. So we think, right, you know, it's snatched away. How awful, how negative, how terrible that it's just snatched away. But it does say that there is a connection point. At some point, there is a connection point. However fleeting, something hits that ground. And for those few moments before it's snatched away, there is an experience. And it sometimes might feel... I know sometimes in the areas of my life where it feels hard and think of a path being hard sometimes and I can think of times when it's been very hard in my life where I've almost maybe even come here and I've heard something and for a few minutes I'm like yes I've got it yes I know what some truth is and then I walk out the door and within five minutes 
it's whoosh, it's like it's gone. But for that moment, there was something planted in me. There was something planted in me, something still happened. Now, the birds may take it because that's what birds do. But what does a bird do with it? It eats it, it poops it out, and then it goes back into the cycle again, still as a scene, comes out somewhere else. So it's not like the whole thing gets recycled somewhere else. So it's not like that kills the kingdom. Yes, it hasn't been able to do as much in that moment at that time as it might have done if the ground was slightly different, but it's not over. Do you get that? It isn't over. It's just doing something else for now and going to get recycled back round. Yes, so it's not a negative. Temporary distracting. It does not vanish, it becomes part of another process. Now, it also says as well about the evil one, snatching it away. Now, we haven't got time to get into views of the devil and where that all fits in. Um, we haven't got time to do that, and I'm not even going to attempt to do it. But just say the evil, whatever that is, snatches something from you. Just say that there are evil things that work in the world that snatches something from you. Is that what wins? Ultimately, is that what wins? Or even when stuff comes against us, what does it say? If God be for us, who can be against us? Even when stuff comes against us, is there still some kingdom that works in the midst of that manure of life? What do you use to fertilize soil? You use manure. You put the muck back in, it turns it over, and it helps something else to grow. So even in the things that are snatched from us, that we allow to be snatched from us, it isn't over. There, the process is still working, the kingdom's still working. Now, the seed on the rock also lands, and again, it does grow. Look at this picture. You'll have all probably seen it before. Now, I blew it up on the right for you. I mean, how does... How was that plant found a way to grow on that rock? That's some mighty powerful nature at work, isn't it, right? Um, now, again, it might not last long or be able to spread in the same way because it doesn't take root. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I need more than one shot at things to get them to get stuck in me. They don't root themselves always very easy, especially in the areas where I'm a bit muddled up. And does every revelation we have in life take root first time? No. Why do we have to go over and over and over and over and over things? Because we're trying to work through all the mess in our life sometimes to actually dig deep enough for something to sink in. And we all have rocks, but something is still growing in us. Even in the areas where sometimes we choke, and even in the areas where sometimes it's like we get so far and it's like we're cut off and we, it feels like a battle, it is still going to grow and kingdom is still working and kingdom is still finding a way and we're still going to get shoots coming up for those rocks. It is still going to happen. Do we endeavour to make more room and to deal with some of those rocks where we can? Yes, because that's helpful and wise, isn't it? But, but it's still going to find a way in the meantime. It's not like there's no fruitfulness that we can have in our life until everything's sorted and all our ducks are in a row. There is still going to be room in our life for this kingdom to work. Now, however, and let me find where I am. How do we maybe, just as an aside, then how do we maybe start to deal with some of those rocks in our life? Well, I think you heard it last week. We've got to do some truth, haven't we? We've got to acknowledge some rocks, own some rocks, ask for help moving some rocks, but we mustn't be afraid of the rocks. We mustn't make those the biggest thing because on that rock, something is still growing. Yes? Yeah. Now, why? Because the seed is the seed and the seed is going to work, and the seed is going to reproduce, and the sower is going to act, and kingdom is going to come. And even in the stuff in our life that's difficult, kingdom is still going to work within that stuff. Now, the story does not say anywhere that unless we get our soil right, we won't get the seed. It doesn't say that. It doesn't. Um, it says we get the seed. It says that the nature of our ground will impact on what that might look like, but there is no single category without hope. There's no single category without hope, none. Um, this, I read this, and it's doing me good, but I'm not sure I'm fully there yet, which I shall explain. 
The seed eaten by the birds is as much the seed as the seed that produced a hundredfold. Now, this is what I heard when I read that. And some of you are going to struggle with this because you're like me and you were raised a certain way with a certain narrative that we had to follow. I am not more worthy when I am good soil than when I am shallow, rocky or thorny. I am not worth more to God when I am good soil than when I am shallow, rocky or thorny. Now, some of you like me, that's like speaking a foreign language. That is because we have worked so hard to be what we understood to be good soil. Good soil looks like this. Good soil looks like that. Good soil has a certain feel to it, a certain sound to it, a certain virtue to it. And if suddenly I find myself not feeling like good soil, then the kingdom coming to me must be different. God must be seeing me differently. Somehow or other, this thing won't work in the same way. Um, Now, that is not something that is easy to understand if all you've learned says differently. But if God's approval depended on our... Um, if God's approval depended in our, on our performance, then it becomes a gospel about my works. And it doesn't become a gospel about his kingdom. It becomes a story about the soil and not about the sower and the seed. And you can't have, have the emphasis both ways. You can't. It's either his work in me that keeps investing regardless or I am the determining factor in the kingdom and I am the biggest discriminator in what happens. Are you, are you hearing that? I know that for some of us it's difficult to wire our head that way, but I think it's incredibly important that we open up the possibility that perhaps the story that we've heard isn't always necessarily the truest form of the gospel. I used to feel like a better person than I am now. I used to feel like a better Christian. I used to feel like a better um, worshipper of God. I used to feel like a better disciple than I do now. I used to feel like I was better at it because I had more tangible structures that I could tick off. And that made me feel good. That made me feel like good soil. That made me feel like worthy soil. And then when things start to not work for you and you can't sustain that level of perceived perfection, you can't, all of a sudden you don't feel like good soil anymore. And all of a sudden you realize that that in your heart, you don't feel that God sees you the same way anymore. Like I say, some of you don't work like that. That's wonderful. But I know that some of you work like that, um, like I do. Now, it says here, um, I used to feel like a better person than I am now, and there were tangible things about me that were good that I could point to, and fewer bad things about me based on the expectations I had about what made a good and bad person. There were lots of good things about me that I could go ask. Because I perfected them. Now, when I remembered yesterday, though, that at all the different stages I have found myself in, the good, the bad, and the ugly, there has not been a single moment in my life where I haven't been part of a kingdom cycle in in me. Now, sometimes that's been the, the poop being recycled in me, and sometimes there's been more manure than there has been other stuff, but there has not been a moment where the kingdom has not been investing in my life, and that is true for you as well. So in the times of your life where you felt like, yeah, I'm getting everything right, it's going brilliantly, that's been kingdom, but in the times of your life where you have just just been the furthest away from what you perceive as being all right as you could ever be, that has been as much part of the kingdom cycle as the other stuff because it's been about what's being invested into you and not about somehow you making everything happen. Now, it says here, and I read this yesterday, I thought this was really interesting. It is the word alone the seed, and not the interference with it that finally counts. 
That's going to be the thing that has the last word. I cannot outdo his investment into my life by my often persistent interference. Do you know, you can try and block every single way in which... Um, you can try and interfere with the kingdom all you want, but do you know what? It's going to keep coming to you. It can't help itself. It can't actually help itself because you're part of that cycle. Thank God. But... The fullest enjoyment, I read this, the fullest enjoyment and fruitfulness of the word is available to those who interfere with it the least. And when we think about interfering with it the least, it is not to do with when we're when we're not, when we're behaving right. I'll tell you what I came to about the interference. The reason why we talk a lot about the ungodlike gods and how Father is like Jesus and Jesus is like Father and about the true gospel and this uncommon view of kingdom is because what interferes with the soil the most is us obsessing with the soil. That's what interferes with it, is us believing that we've got to make everything sorted. That's the interference. The interference in the story is, this is about me. This is about me getting it right. This is about people getting it right. This is about us. This is about how we can make, sh- we can make kingdom happen. And forgetting the power and the greatness of a kingdom that finds a way to grow even in that. That's the kingdom we're in. That's the kingdom we're in. It finds a way to grow even in that. Now, which is worth your time worrying about how you're going to make a plant grow out of a rock or living in awe of the fact that it can? So in life, should we be worrying about how we're going to make stuff happen or living in awe of all the things we can look at as evidence of how this thing can grow against all odds. I think that's a better investment of our attention and faith and would produce way more kingdom because it says the good soil is about us understanding. If we understand that that is what the kingdom of God is capable of, a rock does not seem as much of a problem, even though naturally speaking, you'd say it's not possible. Now, what is the word then? It says that the seed is the word. Is it the Bible? Is it about us finding lots of Bible verses um, that we use all the time over people? Is that what the word is? Now, there might be times when it is incredibly useful to use Bible verses as confession of things and people. But the biggest version, the umbrella of all that, is that Jesus was the word made flesh. Jesus is what the Father had to say about himself. That, he said, this is, this is what I've got to say. This man is what I've got to say. So in, if anything we read or hear or say has to be filtered through that expression, this man of faith, this good shepherd, the one who said that his way wasn't going to be to do with wrath or violence, but one of love and a love that extends even to your enemies, and a kingdom that's about a peaceable kingdom. It's that. That's the word that we've got to understand. And the point about good soil is not that the soil has made itself good by doing all the right things, saying all the right prayers, believing all the right things, the right thing. but the point about the good soil it is that there's nothing in the way of that seed growing, because it's Jesus plus nothing. It's not Jesus in my life plus everything I can do to make it happen, plus all the things I've got to get right, plus all the things I've got to really fix in my life, plus all the obstacles I've got to overcome, plus all the effort I've got to make. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's saying, I follow the the being that can do that, that can grow that out of that. And that's what I'm going to understand. So in my life, when I see rocks, in other people's life, when I see rocks, that's what I'm going to understand. It's possible. Um, The seed is not about, the seed is not being punished where it is not allowed to grow. So there's no judgment on the ground. It doesn't say there was a rocky ground and the rocky ground was really naughty and awful because it was rocky. How dare it have rocks? That's not in the story, it was just, 
it's just, yeah, that's just what it was. And there was going to be things it had to overcome, but it was not a problem in itself because there was going to be a way. Now, uh, where am I? I don't know where I am. I'm nearly, I'm nearly done, if that helps. Um, now, we are not being punished where we set up obstacles. So if we're putting things in the way of kingdom growing, it's not that we're being punished. It's just that we might miss out on some stuff. So if you're deliberately putting some stuff in the way that's going to be unhelpful to your life, um, God's not going to go zap, you're not part of it anymore. You just might have some consequences that you wish you wouldn't got. It, that, it's just not helpful to you. Um, and you miss out on all those things, on doing truth, on doing life, on doing love, um, because we've got no room for that because you're trying to busy, busy trying to deal with stuff that's not helpful. Now, do you know what I think the overriding message is of this story? Um, now, I didn't yesterday when I started, but this is what I think now, um, that this thing called kingdom is going to multiply. It's going to multiply 160 or minimum 30-fold. Starts with the biggest number, doesn't it? I love that. So the main message for me now of this story is, do you know what? Whatever is going on, whatever's going on in me, in the people around me, in the stuff that I see, this kingdom is going to multiply. It is going to find a way. And the minimum it's going to be is 30-fold. And it's likely to be 100, because that comes first. Yes. Which, that's a fairly good message, isn't it? Yeah. In, it's like yeast in dough. What happens when yeast is in dough? It does its work unseen, but it's very powerful. It's pretty much unstoppable. Now, the snatching of the seed by the devil and the rejection of it by the shallow and the choking, by of, it, choking of it by the worldly, all of that still pl takes place within the kingdom that's growing. And did you get that? So when things are being snatched and taken, and when some people aren't interested, they're like, I don't care. And when other people seem to be so obsessed with things that we would say weren't godly, do you know that within all that, the kingdom's still growing? <gasps> yeah! The kingdom's still growing. There isn't a corner of this world you could look to where some kingdom isn't working. Think of the worst situation you can think of in the world right now. And you know that the kingdom is growing. It's finding a way through. It's finding a way through. That was amazing. Um, now, to me, we're back to the... You know, the, my, one of my favorite stories is that one about the width of the boat, where the disciples are in the width of the boat, and they go fishing, and they put down the nets on one side. They catch nothing. And Jesus comes up and says, throw your nets over the other side of the boat, because that's going to make all the difference, isn't it? You know, to go from there to there. And he throws, they throw the net over the other side, and they catch a whole bunch of fish, which, again, you think, well, what's all that about? And again, I love that story because it reminds us that sometimes some of these shifts we've got to make in our thinking, you might think, well, what does it matter? It matters so much, because for as long as we're obsessing about how people are and the types of people we're working with and the types of things we see, in people, we lose sight of what kingdom is able to catch and handle in its net. So we can hear that this story is about these different types of people. And if we hear from, if we fish on that side of the boat where it's about the soil and what people are doing, we become obsessed with the state of people. We become obsessed with people who don't understand anything about kingdom. Well, what are we doing for those people? How are we going to make them understand kingdom? We're not really doing enough to make them understand kingdom, really. Are we really doing enough about that? Should we be saying more? Should we be doing more? Should we be thinking more? Should it look different to this? Um, those people over there are too shallow. We've got to get some depth into those people. We've got to get them really properly discipled. Um, those people are too distracted. They're not really with us. Those people just are worrying about things that don't matter. Those people are too worldly. Um, those people are too materialistic. Those people over there are inferior. Those people over there are superior. Those people over there are being really fruitful, but over there, that's just not fruitful at all. We shouldn't be doing that. Do you see what happens? How and don't we spend hours doing that? Um, or we get obsessed with ourselves. Well, I just don't get it. I can't do it. I'm, I'm just really confused. I don't understand why we have to keep going over all this stuff that's really deep all the time. I'm just so confused. I don't get any of it. 
Or, um, I just can't make, anything, I can't make anything stick in my life. I try really hard at this God thing, and it doesn't work, and I'm so useless, and I'm so awful, and I might as well quit. Um, I'm just too busy. I'm just too frightened. I've just got too much on. I'm just not good enough. And can you see, it's all about, it's all fishing on this side of the boat, and it's just, and you don't catch anything. You don't grow a kingdom. It, it, it's just, rah. I do it, so I can say that. Um, it becomes about me. It becomes about you, and it becomes about our shortcomings or our virtues, both of which are an equal problem. Because if we're in a place where we're obsessing about shortcomings, that's a problem. If we're so busy obsessing over our virtues, that is as much a problem as it is if we're worrying about things that aren't okay. Um, now, if we move the width of a boat, ah, I to decide. what do we find? That the story is about how great the kingdom is, and whatever hindrances there appear to be in the course of life being life, life being life, people being people, kingdom remains. Kingdom grows at a minimum rate of 30-fold in all of that. It prevails, it recycles, and ultimately, it thrives. Yay! It's all really positive, isn't it? It's all really happy, smiley rainbows. Now, do you know that the kingdom is going to thrive in you regardless of any obstacles, past, present, and future. It's going to find a way to grow. It is. It can't help itself. Even you can't stop it, which is just amazing. I just think it's amazing. Now, how? Because it is given to you, and it cannot be taken back. It has been given as a gift. You can't take back a gift. A gift is a gift. Um, and it's always coming, always. Kingdom's coming, always coming. And it replenishes, restores, revives, always. It always does its thing. It just does. Um, now, is my job to obsess about the state of people's lives? Or is it to keep being part of scattering this seed, of partnering with kingdom? I get to be part of the sowing. I get to think, well, never mind about my soil. My soil's going to be my soil, and sometimes it's going to be pretty, and sometimes it's not. But I'm just going to go and stand on the side of the farmer and do some scattering of this, do some scattering of this seed, um, and to keep saying that his love's going to overcome. His love's going to overcome in the face of all obstacles. Let me read one last thing, okay? There's a verse in Isaiah that I remember today. I don't think this is God speaking. I don't think the way you think... The way you work isn't the way I work, God's decree. For as the sky soars high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work, and the way I think is beyond the way you think. Just as rain and snow descend from the skies and don't go back until they've watered the earth, doing their work of making things grow and blossom, blossom, producing seed for farmers and food for the hungry, so will the words that come out of my mouth not come back empty-handed." They'll do the work I sent them to do. They'll complete the assignment I gave them. He said, this thing's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's not going to come back to me empty Hampton. What Jesus came to express and to establish is happening. It happened. It's happening. It will happen. It just is. Um, and you say, I hear you say, but, 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 but. No, oh, that's the story. Um, it will find a way, and as we understand that tonight, it will clear our um, soil up a bit as a byproduct of understanding that it rests in his greatness and not in ours. And as we understand that it rests in his greatness and not in the state of us, um, it's going to be something you want to share. So my conclusion is that we need to find a way to rest whatever condition we're in which we find hard, actually, because we obsess over ourselves too much. We do. Because kingdom is growing in you, and kingdom is growing around you, and it is finding the way in the most challenging of your circumstances, and even the poo of your life has seed in it. Excellent. Um, so have some hope. Um, and let's put faith in the power of his investment rather than despair at where we see either ourselves or others falling short. Let's put, invest our time in his investment, not in our shortcomings or virtues. And perhaps you, like me, really need to evaluate where you've placed your hopes over the years. I've placed too much hope in me getting it right. Um, which is silly. 
I mean, what, who did I think I was? <laughs> who did I think I was? Um, that's not the true gospel. The, true, the gospel never required me to get it right. It required me to trust in his investment. That's the gospel. Um, and when we do that, what we understand is that there is an inevitability. I love that word. It is bound to happen. Kingdom is going to find a way to keep growing in me. Um, that is inevitable. So I can rest. Um, and I can smile. Yeah. Because it's all right. Um, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.